welcome to another one of our um, webinars. So this is, you know, our probably our the, this is the second to the last um, webinar session we'll be having, and I'm hoping to have a face-to-face -face, um, webinar sometime in December with a few interesting parties. But we'll wait for that to happen. Um, but I want to thank each and every one of you for making time out to join this webinar. Um, it's going to be a very interactive and interesting session because we're discussing a, a sort of buzz topic, should I say, at the moment. You know, everyone's on about AI, robotics, and and where are we heading as, you know, as, 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 as a race in terms of the human race, should I say. So, um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to um, listening to what, you know, we have in store on this session. And, of course, looking forward to the mind-blowing insight that will be shared during the course of our conversation. Um, so again, thank you all so much for coming. Do not forget to um, your you can ask questions. Um, we 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 sort of um are not too fussed on our approach for questions, but we rather not interrupt whoever is speaking at the time. So you know, save your questions till either the very end or raise your hands, and then we'll sort of um um call your name to ask your questions directly to either of us. Um, so that's that's highly encouraged. So um, I think we just kick things off with a little introduction. Um, so for those of you who don't know, I am Shay Les Kiru, um, a strategy and transformation um, expert. I've been doing this for quite a number of years in the energy utilities um, space. I'm the CEO and founder of Oculus Consulting or Oculus Group, which has a global consulting firm sort of attributed to it as well. Um, we help businesses more or less unlock their full potential. Um, you know, I, I people say I'm a visionary leader, <laughs> you know, and, a, and to be quite frank, a proven track record, a proven successful track record. And I'm really passionate about helping businesses, you know, achieve their goals and objectives, obviously taking into account things like technology um, solutions, as well as, you know, processes. And we tap into the soft skill element. This is what makes us unique as an organization. But it's really not about me today, guys. It's all about our speaker, um, Mr. Ade Famuti. Um, Ade, thank you very, very much for taking time out to join us on this um, com um this webinar. Um, so for those of you who are not aware or who haven't done your research, um, Mr. Adi Famuti is the business and go-to market leader in autonomous system division at Microsoft, focusing on aerial and terrestrial robotic simulation and working closely with the multidisciplinary technology and research team to evolve um, research into products. That is fantastic. So he, he's the man, <laughs> more or less, around this place. So um, welcome, Adi. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, oh, thank you, sir. Yeah, I must say again, it's it's a pleasure having you on here. Thanks for taking time out because I understand your schedule is really busy. And um, obviously, you know, we have to lock you down for just an hour. Uh, hopefully, yeah, just an hour. We'll try not to go over the hour. Um, so I think to set the scene, I'll just sort of bring everyone up to speed around the current state of AI and robotics, you know. Um, as we are all aware, you know, AI and robotics are a critical intersection where technology is maturing enough to be implemented across you know, various industries, you know, but what is still required, whether we like it or not, is sort of fine tuning to realize its full potential, you know, so it's an evolving technology. And like I tell my colleagues, my, my partners or business um, friends, should I say, you know, like any technology, there's always room for improvement. And yes, AI has taken things a step further. However, there's a lot of room for improvement, you know, so while AI can handle complex data analysis, you know, to drive decision making robotics as well is increasingly used to make this automation happen, you know, so making both sort of indispensable and sectors like healthcare manufacturing and even smart cities come to reality. You know, so some of the trends include things like obviously edge computing, human AI collaboration, um, tech, obviously. And when you talk about leveraging AI and robotics as a tool, you know, you think about efficiency, you think about automation, you think about data driven decisions, and of course, accessibility and so on to actually getting and making the most of this um, technology so um over to you Ade what what are your thoughts um you know perhaps just kick off with an introduction tell us a little bit more about yourself before we dive into the topic all right uh Sherry, thank you so much um for the very kind introductions um just a little bit more about myself uh, as you said I'm Ade uh Ade uh Famoti and I've uh, got about two decades um, in the technology industry, um, pretty much at the intersection of business uh, strategy. Um, and uh, I've worked uh, in, in a continuum of sort. Um, and in that continuum, uh, I, I lead a, a global AI simulation effort, uh, leading go-to-market for that effort uh, within, within Microsoft. 
So over the last uh, two decades, I've stayed pretty close to, uh, you know, prevailing uh, uh, technologies and evolution within the within the technology space. Um, my uh, AI training is from MIT. I went to undergrad at, uh, at Morgan State University in Baltimore. And uh, my graduate school degree is from Columbia University. So pretty much all technology focused at some point. But uh, as I said, just that intersection of business technology and you know, next generation uh, disruptive tech uh, has really been the cost of where I've, I've played. So thank you so much. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here. Uh, I also appreciate the opportunity that, that to accommodate my time zone. So thank you for that. No, thank you. Thank you very much, Adi. Yeah. So, so yeah. Mm -hmm. okay, yeah, go on. No, just uh, re and, you know, a bit of response to uh, you know the opening that I heard you say. Um, I think you're you're absolutely right. We're seeing uh, you know we're almost like in an AI revolution, if I put it that way. So you know, start by saying I think um, if you go back about five hundred and thirty mil five hundred thirty million years ago, and that's a long time, um, life form on our planet Earth. Um, evolved from a single cellular organism. So we're single. It was a single cellular organism, and then now since evolved into multicellular organisms. So pretty much evolving into all the biological life forms we have on the planet today. Okay, it started as a single cell, and pretty much all the life forms we have today. And that whole era, uh, that whole evolution, it happened in a non-trivial time, about fifteen to twenty million years. Um, and, you know, that old era, you know, and it's called the Cambrian explosion. So pretty much where all the life forms evolved. And I think similarly um, for AI and robotics, uh, specifically AI, artificial intelligence, uh, we're seeing uh, almost like a, a similar explosion in, in a machine learning methods and deep learning methods uh, with the, the, the AI is a lot more adept at, uh, at human comprehension. Uh, understanding data um, is having a profound impact and will have a profound impact in how we work, live, um, and learn. And it's it's an, it, it will be integrated and infused into our daily lives. So uh, so it's an interesting, um, it will have an interesting impact um, in the world we live today. So no doubt uh, everyone uh, should be tuned to, you know, evolving technologies, evolving approaches for AI and machine learning. No, that's that's um well said, Adi, and I, I completely agree with you because I mean this whole AI thing. I know it's always been there in the background, but there was this recent um, you know, global buzz around ChatGPT that came out, and everybody was like, "Oh my God, have you used this tool? Do you know what ChatGPT does?" And it became like a global thing, and it's it's used in schools, it's used out in offices, it's used everywhere. Even people no longer think anymore it's ChatGPT that seems to do everything. You know, and it just got me thinking around how impressive um, AI handles, you know, data analytics and interpretation. You know, of course, even the whole natural language processing side of things, you know, because it can be used for various um, programming related tools, you know, medical advances, you know, enhanced personalization of information, you know, and then it also helps with reinforcing the concept behind learning. But what's also very impressive is the whole automation side of things, which obviously sits very much within what you do in robotics. So it's... um. It's it's quite interesting, you know. So ba based on some of these things, sometimes I wonder what are the main challenges, you know, that need to be addressed to realize, you know, to fully realize the potential of AI and robotics. You know, what, what's your take on this, Adi? Yeah. So um, so there's a lot of buzz um, uh, in you know, around AI, uh, around machine learning, and robotics, and it's it's not unfounded, uh, but. I would say there's still a long ways to go uh, in terms of, you know, just the research, the innovation, the evolution of, you know, of AI and machine learning um, and robotics in our daily lives. So I'll give an example, uh, just the sort of, you know, massive gap between uh, human and machine uh, comprehension and reasoning. So I have a five-year-old. Uh, I can tell my five-year-old to uh, to uh, take their to take their food or their their leftovers into the refrigerator. I can tell my five-year-old to uh, put the leftovers in the trash. I can tell him to go wash the dishes. All in one, you know, uh, and those tasks are pretty easy. All in one instruction. But as simple as that is, um, that's that's hard for um, uh, for a machine to comprehend. So we still have a long ways to go. 
Um, and it's interesting what I describe now, we, you know, we call it the uh, Moravex paradox. So basically, you know, hard things are easier for machines to comprehend. Easy things are not for machines to comprehend. So there's still a, a, a long ways to go. Uh, similarly, you know, uh, I have a 14-year-old uh, uh, in two years who's going to be uh, asking for a learner's permit to go drive. I think two years when he's 16, uh, you know, I can give him 20 hours of learning and he can learn how to drive. But a machine or a robot can't do that in 20 hours, you know. So I would say there's still um, a massive way for the research uh, to get machines, AI, and robots to human-level intelligence. So that said, there's um, from a business standpoint, there's a lot more to go. There's a lot more to solve for. There's regulation that has to be solved. So how do we keep AI um, away from the hands of bad actors, right? So AI is great. It, it enhances productivity. Uh, it advances human machine collaboration. But how do you make sure it's not in the hands of bad actors, right? Um, there's uh, the re responsible use of it as well. Like how do we you know, circumnavigate the responsible use of, of AI, uh, ensuring that it's not used in a way that um, is biased or prejudiced. So there's still massive ways to go. And I think also there's still public acceptance. So uh, a lot of people are still one eye open, one eye closed. Uh, you know, they're taking a look and see approach like you know, this AI, you know, uh, do we, you know, integrate and embed this into our business systems or do we just watch? Uh, so I would say there's still several challenges that need to be solved in those regards. Well, that that's well said, uh, Madi. You know, and I think I, I completely agree with you around, particularly around even the emotional intelligence, should I say, of AI. You know, I think I think that's definitely going to take a while because the amount of algorithms that perhaps go into it was must be a lot, right? And um, you know, I I I I might be wrong and correct me if I'm wrong, but I really don't see AI replacing um our human you know, who, who we are as a, as a human race, you know, um, I know some of you, I, I see Asif smiling as well. Like, um, that's my plan. You know, we're going to use robots to take over sanitization globally, <laughs> you know, but I think, I think it would happen, but it would take a while. Um, so for those of you who are not aware, as, as if he's, um, he's got a business in um, Vancouver that actually use robots to do sanitization. So that's why I sort of cracked that joke, you know, um, but I think I think we still have a long way to go. Um, I, I I was thinking, could we do some deep dive into some of the real world scenarios where AI and robotics could be a lot more instrumental? You know, um, I I know there's a lot in the in the, in the medical space and um, the automotive space. Um, you know, like where like you know, especially from a robotic standpoint, because if I'm being honest with you, um, I I find I can easily relate to AI, but with robotics, I struggle. You know, and, and from a robotic standpoint, it's not just when I think robots, I think humans that are robots. But the, I know there's a lot in the um, aerospace going on. You know, there's a lot of technology out there that sort of advancing how crafts, you know, should I say, are are used. You know, I know companies like Amazon are using drones and so on to deliver packages, you know. And, and for me, I think that's an element of robotics. Correct me if I'm wrong, you know, but where where are we heading in, in, in the robotics world as well? Yeah, so, so let me start by saying uh, that AI, uh, artificial intelligence, um, and its subfield um, is slightly, you know, it's very different from robotics. So robotics, in a sense, is uh, a different domain on its own, but they do complement, you know, and I think where they, that complement is, and is, uh, is, is autonomy, right? How to get, you know, robots to have you know, human-like intelligence uh, through, you know, algorithms. So I would say uh, for AI, uh, there is massive, massive uh, utility of AI today, um, even in our daily lives. As a matter of fact, uh, today, a lot of us don't know we use AI. So I'll share some use cases. You go home, you turn on your TV, you're watching Netflix. Uh, when you turn on Netflix, the first thing that comes to you is it gives you uh, a view of um, programs you've watched. And also gives you recommendations of programs you may like. That is a it's called a recommender system, and that's based on AI. So today in our daily lives, you're seeing this in Netflix. Uh, if you have voice assistants like Alexa, like Google Home, uh, like Siri on your phone, those are voice assistants that are based on natural language. So you uh, ask Alexa to Alexa, what's the weather? Or for example, it's a your natural uh, your voice has a natural input. Uh, it you know it. You know, it uh, infuses its uh, machine learning algorithms and it outputs 
on certain suggestions or assistance based on what you're asking. So that's AI that is in our daily lives. It's in right there in the purview. Um, I would say also, if you think from a business standpoint in financial services, so uh, financial services use AI today for things like uh, AML, anti-money laundering, uh, to you know ensure the integrity of, and operational uh, efficiencies of what they do at banking and finance. Uh, they use it for customer segmentation uh, today. Uh, so uh, companies will uh, can use AI to segment their customer base, right? Uh, who's in this demographic? Who's got this? You know, who's earning certain within a certain range? And they can use those AI um, methods to segment and target um, certain services and goods to their customers. Um, another good example is search. Mm -hmm. If you if you're searching today on Bing or Google or one of the other search engines, you're using in some way those recommendations from the search results are based on AI. Um, so, and that's been, so a lot of us don't know, we're actually already daily consumers of AI, um, in the way we live and the way we work, um, and the way we even learn. So, um, a good example that you mentioned is medical and I want to just to hone in on medical. So today AI, um, is used to, for diagnosis, for anti-cancer imaging, to, you know, to look at cells or perhaps down at the uh, cellular level. Uh, to see if there's any anomalies around cells, right? And it gives you diagnosis, uh, it gives you quick identification of diseases. So the medical field is fully embracing AI. And I think similarly, if you look at more uh, medical research, so uh, AI is being used for things like, you know, genome sequencing, you know, DNA sequencing, you know, RNA modifications, you know, a lot of research around just deep, a bit more depth at the cellular level. Um, and so AI is having some tremendous reception in medical. Uh, as a matter of fact, what AI is also doing in medical is it's challenging business models. Uh, so we're seeing, for example, traditional pharmaceuticals that are now even going as far as buying AI companies. So, <laughs> so that's an interesting uh, disruption in medical and pharma. And, and pharma. Uh, for automotive, because I've already mentioned autom auto automotive also, um, so if we if you look at for example in most cars that roll out of the assembly line today, uh, they're using AI based sensors or sensors that in some way rely on you know machine learning and AI. So uh, most cars have you know they've got a range of sensors today, sonars and radar and even sometimes lidar, um, and those sensors basically fuse together you know in a way to assist the driver. So it's almost you know it gives the driver. Um, a bit more uh, situational awareness as they drive. Um, and you can think within that spectrum, there's also cars that are evolving into self-driving cars. So think about the likes of Teslas, the likes of robo-taxis that aim and aspire to drive themselves. That is all based on AI. So, I mean, so pretty much it's, it's in our daily lives. It will be infused in how we live in the future. Uh, domestically, um, you know, it, Today, a lot of us have this robot vacuum cleaners like the likes of the Roombas, right? That pretty much are based on AI. Uh, they navigate your homes or your offices, they clean, they identify where the spaces are and they get the job done. So, so we're seeing this today, even domestically. Um, for robotics, I'll go further and say, um, uh, what, we're, what the industry is moving towards is using robots to de-risk what the humans will do. So for example, tasks that are very dangerous, um, robots will go do that task. For, so for example, inspecting cell towers. So imagine cell towers have to be inspected. Sometimes humans have to climb those cell towers. Mm -hmm. So now you can use robots. You can use like uh, drones or aerial robots to, to do those tasks. Um, oil rig inspections, onshore, offshore, uh, midstream, upstream, you could use uh, either terrestrial robots, robots that crawl or walk, or robots that fly themselves. Again, drones to go do those midstream, upstream, you know, downstream inspections. So we're seeing utility across business, across consumer, domestically at home. Um, the impact and the profound implications of AI and robotics is all around us. That is very, very interesting, Amadi. You know, I, I I like the way you broke it down, and the way it sort of plays out in my head is I I I would look at um, you know, AI as what provides, should I say, the brains that sort of guides the robotic body, 
if that if that makes any sense you know so ai helps with like you know um it makes basically makes robots smarter you know and more adaptable based on you know decision based like data to guide its decisions you know and and yeah you're right you know you touched on the autonomous and vehicles you know whilst you were saying some of these i actually looked up a few things and um, it's very impressive what's happening in the autonomous vehicle space you know there's a case study around way more you know a subsidiary of um, alphabet you know where they have the whole concept behind self-driving which i know is not particularly new but it's impressive how they've really advanced in that space as well and of course surgical robots like you touched on you know it's pretty impressive what's happening around there like you know very you know because i can imagine humans i i, I mean okay before i even go into this point i just say there's concerns around you know would all this take over the jobs we have you know from uh you know like robots and doctors and so on because robots are very precise you know and i know a lot of things are built with robots but there's also an argument, well, like cars, for instance, Mercedes, you know, there was a time where in their um, factories, a lot of cars were made with robots, but they actually apparently went back for the very premium cars to be made by hand because they found it's a lot more, you know, it's built better. I mean, you can argue otherwise, but I think for me, as a human buying a car that I know has been made by hand, I get a different type of satisfaction. So I, I wonder, you know, when is it all going to, should I say, evolve? You know, and then of course, you know, agriculture as well, you know, the agriculture robots, you know, um, John Deere autonomous and tractors, you know, and of course you mentioned drones, you know, they use AI to monitor crop health, you know, automate tasks like seeding, spraying, and um, of course harvesting the crops as well. So it's really, really, really impressive, you know. So 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 that said, um Ade, you know, um I'm just curious. So where where do you see things going, you know, from a uh, robot especially robotics, you know, like what do you think is the next big thing for robotics? You know, because I see AI, I think we're in that bubble right now. But for robots, you know, is it they're going to make like super small, intelligent robots or we're expecting large robots or, or I mean, where, where do you see that space going? Robotics is an interesting uh, domain, um, you know, complementary to, to AI. Uh, I mentioned that in, that intersection is you know, is autonomy where you're bringing machine level intelligence into robots, uh, into embodied robots. And as a matter of fact, we call that embodied AI. Mm -hmm. um, so where, where robots are going um, is pretty profound. Uh, I'll mention a, a couple of, uh, of, of uh, you know, perhaps re echo a couple of comments. Uh, one is just robots will take away dangerous tasks uh, from humans. So think about that from the military and defense scenario or from law enforcement, uh, you will see a lot more robots doing uh, very dangerous tasks in both military and, 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 and for the police, right? There's like bomb diffusions or, you know, hostage scenarios, or perhaps going into hostile territory uh, and, and, and conflict. Um, and, and, you know, and that's, that's profound. So think about the lives, the loss of lives that can be mitigated with robots. And this is where robots are going in defense and military. Um, in the aviation sector, um, uh, traditional aircraft um, are becoming a lot more autonomous. So I wouldn't say they're robots, but they're getting a lot more autonomous. So um, the first commercial flight was in 1914, right? You know, the planes take off, the pilots pilot the plane, they, you know, it cruises, it takes off, it cruises, it lands. Uh, there's a lot more infusion of, um, of autonomy into aviation. So there's uh, uh, next or future uh, technology, future level technology uh, called eVTOLs, electric vertical takeoff and land, which basically will be a class of aircraft or, 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 or you know, I guess airplanes, if we call it that, that are powered by elect electricity, but may or may not be piloted by a human pilot. So this is the next level. This is what we're seeing. Um, think about drones uh, or perhaps last mile delivery. Uh, robots will be used a lot more. Uh, there will be a lot more adept at the last mile scenario. So last mile means delivery of package of, of goods and services to humans. Um, so imagine case in point, imagine a drone, you order from Tesco, uh, a drone brings your order from Tesco. And this is a robot. This is an aerial robot that could sense, see, perceive its environment, right? Um, semantically. And it can drop your package from Tesco at your front door. So this is where we're seeing robots going. And of course, I mentioned, um, you know, domestically, we've been using this for a while. 
um, you know, just the role of robots in that house. Robots will clean. Uh, robots will cook. Uh, robots will, you know, uh, attend to domestic tasks task in the house. So I will mention a, a scenario. A few years ago, um, I was on a cruise. I was on a cruise ship. Um, I was going through the Caribbean and South America. And the cruise ship um, had a bar. You know where you can go make a cocktail or mocktail or you know get some 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 drink and the bartender was a robot right you had to you could you order your drink and the robot will mix your cocktail your mocktail or any drink you want this is where we're going uh so i wouldn't see it as uh, uh eliminating jobs but it would augment labor it would augment jobs it would augment uh it would the risk where humans um you know where humans will be um exposed to to harm so so this is where robots are going wow i i think that's very 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 informative actually i think at this point we'll take a quick break and then you know open the floor to them to the audience you know i'm sure a few people have questions um again i like to make this a very interactive session so please if you have any questions you, you're more than welcome to unmute your mic and um speak directly to us and you can target your questions at anyone in particular I'm um, just a, a heads up as well. We try to avoid very sensitive um, questions or topics rather, you know, because we have to respect the speakers as well. So avoid anything political, you know, avoid anything that would sort of, you know, force Adi to say what he's not meant to say considering he's part of Microsoft. So let's all just bear that in mind, please. Um, so any, any questions, anyone, please feel free. I mean, I, I'd like to think we're not shy because I know I had a few questions prior to, <laughs> to this. Yeah, and, and <laughs> any, any question is fair game uh, yeah. no, no, no. as much as I can to, to address it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, no, thanks, Ade. Okay, I see Asif is on meeting. That's a good start. Thanks for setting the, the ball. <laughs> right. Asif. Yeah, I'm just enjoying Ade's insights. They're <laughs> absolutely real world. And like you said, robots are going to take over all the dangerous jobs that's 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 what we are we are targeting See, because sanitization and uvc is not um, not very human friendly it causes skin <laughs> cancer and all sort of things <laughs> so that's true. that's what we want to pass it on to the robot to do yeah that, that's great and just just curious yes. you find there's a lot of demand for that offering from a robotics and ai perspective uh covid has changed a lot of people's priorities and sanitization and keeping uh, we we're, we're mainly focusing on the hospitality sector hospitality and uh, food restaurants so that that's something where sanitization is quite important and uh, it will affect other people so people can't take it uh, can't take it easy on that yeah i know that, that that makes a lot of sense you know? and i think that's mm. another um, area of topic which we'll be literally going to the second um, phase of this conversation which is um you know, partly to do with, um, should I say, developing nations um, in particular. So if I think of some parts of Africa where, you know, we don't have the best connectivity, you know, internet and so on, how do we see AI and robotics um, sort of influencing those regions? You know, is there scope for improvement? You know, Adi, what's your, what, what's your take on this as well? Um, as if your mother welcome to, 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 to say a few things as well. Uh, sure. I, I'll let, let Adi go ahead. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, no, I think it's a great question. Uh, emerging markets aren't left behind. Um, so we're going through an AI uh, renaissance. Um, so um, a lot of the uh, collaborations uh, in, in industry uh, for AI, they're also happening in emerging markets. Um, a lot of the students who research it is from emerging markets um, working in um, and in the more developed uh, uh, geographies, and they're taking a lot of the, those um, uh, learnings back. Uh, so I, so I, I don't see. Uh, I think it, it presents an opportunity uh, for um, for those markets to to catch up and to ramp up. Um, I don't see uh, uh, the internet as a huge inhibitor. Uh, so, for example, in Africa, um, a lot of the countries have ninety plus internet penetration just by the proliferation of mobile technologies uh, and smartphones in those regions. Um, so uh, the consumption of, of AI, or for example, if, if we use, for example, ChatGPT, uh, which can do text summarizations and I can do human level comprehension, reasoning, 
the consumption of that could be through a mobile device, uh, either ChatGPT directly or APIs that connect to ChatGPT. Um, for robotics, it, I would say um, uh, robots are at the edge devices. So they're really just sitting there at the edge, sometimes very minimal requirements for internet or sometimes no requirements for internet. Uh, they do have uh, the human um, assistant or human controller um, that you know is on hand at any time. So think about drones, as I mentioned. In emerging markets, drones have been used for oil rig inspections, for cellular tower inspections, uh, for agriculture inspections, for surveying, for law enforcement. They're doing all that today. Um, and because they're edge devices, they're very, there's very minimal requirements uh, for internet access and things like that. Um, uh, similarly, um, uh, for robots, um, you, you don't need, um, in those parts, you know, where we, in our emerging markets, the regu the regulatory posture is a lot more relaxed than in more developed geos. So for example, you could go fly a drone or an autonomous aircraft, um, in Africa, because some of the regulation, um, isn't as stringent. So that gives even more opportunity for people to do business in those parts, like Africa, as you know, South America, perhaps in, in Asia, to go explore, you know, that intersection of AI and robotics. Yeah, well, that, that that's very very informative. Um, you know, um, I I think that that actually touches on sort of me bringing back um sort of going back to the core of our conversations. You know, around you know from a strategic perspective, if I can say, you know, how can businesses you know, and educational institutions prepare for this ongoing integration of AI and robotics. I know we've touched on a few of those already, you know, from an agricultural perspective, you know, and so on. But what what what's your take on that, Ade? Yeah. So um it, it, it's an AI revolution, right? So it's it's um be part of this revolution or get left behind. That that would be my headline comment. Uh the second thing is it, um I'm not gonna ask everyone don't run in a business to go deploy AI or go deploy robots. No, I mean, conventional means and ways of working still exist, right? But I would ask you to evaluate uh, what I call the Trinity, the Holy Trinity of business impact, right? And for any business person, uh, if you, would AI and robotics bring you uh, value? You know, would it bring the right sort of viable value, valuable uh, value, and is it doable? So, you know, AI and AI and you know could be interesting, but may not be viable in your business context or may not bring that sort of value. So I would just say keep close to that holy trinity of, of, of impact. Is it viable? Is it doable? And is it valuable to your business? That's it for businesses. Um, there are a couple of things I could I can I I would I could think about. Uh don't rush. <laughs> business, it's a revolution, but I would advise businesses to start with a crawl, walk, run. Start by crawling, get your feet wet in the technologies, get familiar with the technologies, uh, educate yourself about the technologies, uh, ensure that your employees are skilled in the technologies. They're attending webinars like this. Um, they're reading resources online about AI. They're understanding the impact it could have in their business sector. Have the crystal clear um synthesis of you know what it means for your business right so if you're in agriculture if you're in manufacturing if you're a consultant what does it mean for you if you're in legal what does it mean for you um there are law firms today um businesses that they're using chat gpt to do summarizations they're telling you know foundational models to you know to look through you know legal briefs you know to look for anomalies look for contradictions in judicial precedents um look for you know uh, uh any sort of uh advantages they could take to court or to litigation. So it's understand what it means for your business, right? For designers or for game designers, understand what AI means for your industry. Are you still that traditional uh, game designer, still using traditional methods where other your competitors using AI techniques? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, this is a couple of trillion dollar industry. Um, uh, you know, gaming and entertainment, you want to make sure that you understand what AI means for your industry. So that's what I would say, crawl, walk, run, uh, educate yourself, uh, start small, don't go crazy with AI, uh, understand what it means for your industry, your sector, 
Um, and of course, be always ready to disrupt yourself. Don't wait to be disrupted. Disrupt yourself. Um, and that means having a long-term vision, right? Uh, using AI approaches, techniques, perhaps even robotics to disrupt yourself, to challenge your business model, uh, to challenge how you traditionally and conventionally do business. So this is what I would tell, I would say for businesses. And for academia, it's, it's a lot easier because um, uh, academia has been right at the frontier of the research around AI and robotics. So a lot of you know universities and schools uh, have partnered with industry, uh, either partnered with industry or they had researchers that came from academia into industry. So academia is well positioned to uh, be ready for this AI revolution, right? So I would encourage them to continue to partner, partner with industry, uh, continue to stay on the cusp of the research, right? Uh, continue to um, encourage innovation labs. So innovation labs where you can have your researchers, you know, get their hands dirty around, you know, AI, around robotics. I mean, this is this is what academia does, right? Um, and I think for academia, um, also the uh, the transfer of of research, right? Almost like an accelerator of research from labs into industry is very key. So um, I would say, you know, your researchers, you need to do internships. They need to do cooperative programs. Uh, they need to be embedded in industry. So your research doesn't stay as just fundamental research, but it, it moves into applied research. So that's what I would say for academia. Yeah, That is actually very informative. And you really got me thinking, you know, because I do agree with a lot of the points you raised. And, you know, I know, so I'm just looking at the time now. We literally got 15 minutes, but I still have a few more very interesting questions, but I think I'll take us into the future, you know. So in terms of, um, you know, where we're heading, you know, um, you know, the future of this technology holds several exciting predictions and trends that, you know, that we aim to make technology more accessible, right? That's ultimately what we're trying to do, you know, and um, you, you, you can't argue it's very beneficial to everyone, you know. So how do you see, for, how do you foresee the role of AI and robotics? You know, evolving the next decade, you know, I mean, a lot has happened in the past few years, you know. Uh, so in the next decade, what's going to happen, you know, and what implications does this have for industries and individuals, you know? And now, before I let you say a few things, you know, I, for, for one, I'm very aware that it's, it's going to cause a shift in the types of um, skills we need. You know, people are going to have to be multi-skilled, you know, and, and really learn and, you know, understand AI is here to stay. I don't think AI is going anywhere, you know. So um, what are your thoughts, Adi? You know, um, I don't have a crystal ball. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking you would, Adi. <laughs> no, I don't have a crystal ball. But um, but if I had to give some intuitions uh, about where all of this will lead to or where it's headed, um we're going to live in an AI driven world. This is the first, uh, this is, this is the first headline thing I would say. Uh, why do I think that, um, AI will disrupt a lot of industries, entertainment as well. Let me start by saying, if you look at the movie industry, um, and these are intuitions that I have, uh, the, if you look at the movie industry, we all have celebrities and actors and that we you know we we go to the movies for to you know watch their movies and we're big fans of those folks 20 30 40 years from now our movie celebrities may not be real <laughs> they, may be, <laughs> they may not be real <laughs> um they will never get old uh they will never die uh they will never get tired and they will you will basically have one character playing James Bond for 300 years because it's an AI synthetically generated actor, right? I see that sort of disruption in, in entertainment and movies. Um, so, so this is my crystal ball for that. Um, I see in, for, for, for work, you know, for the knowledge worker, um, you know, some, some folks in this call are based in the US, some are based in Europe. Um, perhaps somebody needs to be somewhere in Asia. I see us having AI-based avatars where you could be in Europe, but your avatar is doing a meeting in China or your avatar is bidding for work somewhere in Manchester while you're in London. I mean, I see things like that. Um, I see where your avatar could perhaps go apply for a job <laughs> and say the things you would say. You would have the 
you know, it will be personalized to you and it will have the, you know, speak in your context, speak in your tone, speak in your voice, have the sort of reasoning and comprehension that you have and, and, you know, and, uh, and, uh, and demonstrate that at an interview. I, I see, I see something like that happening. Um, so uh, I'll give a, a few more thoughts. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I see a few uh, uh, 10, 20 years from now. Um, uh, I mentioned aerospace, and I started my career in aerospace. I worked for Lockheed Martin. Um, I see uh, an aviation sector where um, is totally driven by artificial intelligence and robotics and infusion and intersection of that. Uh, you can travel between uh, um, San Francisco and New York um, in an autonomous aircraft. No pilot, autonomous aircraft means there are no pilot. I can see that happening. Today, when you get into an aircraft, if you do a transatlantic flight, um, the pilot is majorly controlling the taxiing, the takeoff, and the land. So the question is, what happens during cruise? A lot of it is, is autonomous today. They never tell you that. <laughs> so so, so that, that will be my crystal ball into the future. <laughs> oh, Adi, I, I must say you really got me thinking, actually. And um, it, it's amazing um, what the future holds. And, and yes, you're right. You know, it, as scary as it sounds, you know, this is why I think, you know, it's very important we all, you know, understand AI robotics is here to stay and learn from it, you know. And, and the reason is because it just it just works to a certain extent. You know, the only concern is, of course, it's sort of going into the hands of the bad actors, you know. And sometimes I wonder what measures, you know, are being put in place to prevent things like that. I'm not sure if that's a question I can ask you, <laughs> you know, but I, I wonder what, what sort of measures, you know, are being put in place. And this is where, for instance, the government really have to play a, a sort of significant role around policy, regulation, and so on. And it becomes very, very tricky, you know. Um, I must say it's been an amazing session so far and I have heard, you know, I've heard a lot, a lot of tips, you know, a lot of things that have actually got me thinking. And even from a consultancy standpoint, you know, I ask myself, well, how can I perhaps better utilize AI? You know, am I doing it right? And to be frank with you, I do agree with you. You need to sort of, you know, see how it fits into what it is you're trying to do as a business or as an individual. You know, what exactly do you want from AI? It's not just a case of AI, AI, AI. You know, you need to sort of, zone it down to your offerings you know so we literally got 10 more minutes so let me just go around again and see if anyone's got some more questions and um, please don't be shy feel free to to open up ask your questions and um, this is a very good platform to get you know answers from the the best in the house if i'm being honest thank you for the kind words <laughs> <laughs> well where you are <laughs> you know and I did just to give everyone some context. So I met Ade at um, one of the conferences in um, Qatar a few years ago. And ever since then, we've become really good friends and I've learned so much from Ade. And I must say, I'm super impressed at some of the, 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 the you know, his thought process around how, you know, just you, 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 you all need to meet him in person. I would strongly suggest you all connect with him on LinkedIn as well. That's just simply how I will put it. He's a, a very, very intelligent um, gentleman. So I guess no questions from anyone. This 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 webinar, I must say, everyone on this call is a little bit shy or just <laughs> not very <laughs> <laughs> forward. So I mean the um, uh, the subject of artificial intelligence has you know obviously gathered you know a lot of uh, momentum and, and buzz. So it's expectedly it's a it's a topic we're all learning. You know, everyone is learning the implications for business, implications for self, implications for for learning how we live, how we work. So it's expected uh, that this could be a learning session. Uh, but I do I would like to address some of the comments around. Uh, you mentioned Shay around the ethics. Yeah. You know, how do we get this out of the hands of bad actors? Um, so uh, I think what the entire industry is focused on, or perhaps concerned about is how do we ensure that AI does not create any existential threats to humanity? Basically, that we don't destroy the planet using AI. So, uh, and you know, that sort of consideration, that sort of thinking will entail governance. Uh, it would entail 
Um, some people argue they would entail regulation. And I'll give a, a case in point. Just this morning, just a few hours ago, uh, in, in the United Kingdom, uh, the Bank of England and the uh, Financial Conduct Authority, FCA, uh, released an AI, um, uh, artificial intelligence uh, uh, paper. Uh, basically, it's an early thinking, um, working with industry, getting uh, comments from industry about, you know, what would be the role of AI in financial services? So think about the operational resiliency that the banks and financial services um, firms have in the UK today. The regulators are thinking, what happens to, you know, consumer confidence? You know, you know, how do you explain, how do we, how do you infuse this AI um, and give it some explainability? Because it's, you know, it will be used as a custodian of people's monies. Um, so, so there's a lot of thinking about this. AI brings tremendous value, but also can bring some, some interesting uh, concerns as well. So regulation will play a big role, perhaps. Uh, governance will play a big role uh, around that as well. Um, so, but it's also um, some diligence that um, practitioners also have to consider. So practitioners are people that use AI, people that research, uh, develop uh, AI tools, uh, to ensure there's no, um, there's enough di diversity and the data these models have been trained on uh, to minimize any sort of bias, any sort of prejudice based on, you know, religion, ethnicity, color, skin color, gender, and sexual preference, things like that. Uh, because uh, machine at the core of AI is machine learning, which is basically using training on data to make predictions, right? So uh, if your data is biased, the predictions will be, and the utility of the AI may be biased as well. So those are some of the ethical concerns. Um, so practitioners have to stay close to bias and you know ensure their their models aren't prejudiced in any way. Um, and of course, um, you know, uh, for a given example, for uh, people from underrepresented uh, or minority um, ethnic groups, uh, there's always that concern. You know, when you start to use AI for things like facial recognition. Um, at airports and public um, venues, you know, how do we ensure that that AI isn't biased towards people of certain skin color, right? So, yeah, so a long ways to go, but the whole industry is trying to solve uh, for some of these considerations. That, that is actually well said, Ade, and, and thank you for touching on that um, topic because I know it's quite a sensitive one, but yeah, I think there's definitely a lot of... Um, you know, work for the government to, to do in this, you know, regulators and so on. And I didn't even know about this um, news in the UK, despite the fact that I'm here in the UK. So um, thanks for, for that update. We, we do have a question, actually, was sent directly to me um, from Osaho. He's um, currently in a place where he can't really speak. He says, he says it's raining over there. So um, I'll just read out his question and bear with me. He says here, um, he says, thank you, Mr. Ade, for the enlightening um, discussion and returning to the challenges around fully harnessing the power of AI due to the comprehensive or comprehension comprehensive gap in human to machine interactions. It's evident that there's a broad spectrum of applications for these technologies. What with that in mind, how crucial do you think it is to have standardized commands and responses to improve human to H2M comprehension? That's the first question. I'm guessing H2M stands for human to machine comprehension. Um, additionally, um, what potential frameworks could we explore to achieve this standardization? Well, I... That's a very loaded question, actually. Yeah. I'll, 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 I'll so... take Sorry, go on. No, thank you. Um, so standardization is, um, is an interesting uh, concept. Uh, and it's still evolving in AI. So uh, obviously there's standards because uh, computer science is um, is a science or that you know it's based on uh, empirical data, improving empirical data, uh, peer review, et cetera. So there's a standardization in how the models are being you know have been uh, created today. So uh, what does that mean? You know how the data is curated, um, how you know the sort of uh, uh, neural techniques, um, or you know, a deep learning that is applied to to the data, uh, how the uh, the models are being tested, and the 
um, the sort of benchmarks that the date the models are being tested on, all of that is standardized. Mm -hmm. So there's a pretty um, basic level of standardization for the models today. But if you standardize how all the um, machine learning and AI um, uh, techniques are being done, you may, you may stifle innovation as well. So there has to be a balance between standardization and of course, innovation. So you can't standardize everything, of course, also for competitive advantage, right? How uh, a technology firm does um, uh, natural language processing, you know, perhaps uh, might be different from how another technology company may do it. Uh, the foundational models will have the same sort of architecture. So think about, you know, perhaps uh, GPT-4 from OpenAI or BART from Google. The, they both have a standardization in terms of the transformer architecture, right? Uh, but in terms of, you know, how they, um, you know, how they output, um, you know, that would be different. That could be different. You know, how they do inferencing, uh, you know, how they scale using, uh, you know, CPUs or GPUs. Um, how this, you know, the utility of how consumers even consume them, very different, either through prompts or how their fine tune could be different, but the basic architecture could be very similar. So, so that would be my first question, right? It's a balance between innovation and, and, you know, not stifling innovation, but of course, you know, ensuring there's a, a bit of standardization because it is based on the science. So, um, I want to make sure if there's any follow-up to that question or something else I can clarify before we go to the next slide. Um, also, have you any questions you want to ask added to that? Or, you know, I, I think for, for me, if I, if I just touch on that, you know, because I know what well, he says, yeah, he says that that's, that, that's fine. Um, you know, I know we published some papers a while ago around AI and there's five five things for us, you know, from a consultancy standpoint, you know, and, and what some of our recommendations really are, you know, there has to be industry-wide collaboration. You know, so I'm looking forward to when the likes of um, Bard or Open AI or, or is it called Open AI, Open Chat GBT, basically, um, Bard, all of them collaborate and say, look, like, how can we collaborate? I think that would make a huge difference, you know, around the sort of um, potential framework and standardization. You know, and then, of course, the whole concept behind open source initiatives, I think that's a really, really big one as well. You know, and then there has to be an element of human centered design. You know, I think that should not go away. We shouldn't let AI take absolute control. That would just be ridiculous. They would they would take us out, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and then, of course, the whole concept behind adaptive learning, I think, is quite important. And, you know, like like Adi rightly said, you know, ethical and cultural considerations has to be factored into the whole concept behind AI. You know, so we, we I think there's an article we published around that, you know, and I think, you know, those five pillars, you know, are quite fundamental, you know, to making this work. Um, let's see if any, any, any other questions, anyone, I mean, Adi, what are your thoughts on what I said? Do you, do you, do you use, does it make sense? Is it aligned with your thinking? Yeah, I, it's, I haven't read the white paper, but, um, I'm very keen to read it, but yeah, yeah a lot of what you said is pretty consistent, um, with, uh, you know, how, you know, how I see this playing out also. Um, I, I do want to stress for, for, for AI, there's some unspoken or this un unspoken or informal guardrails around the, the use, the responsible use of, of AI and perhaps robotics or embodied AI where AI is uh, in, into, you know, physical robots. And it, it's based on something in, in, uh, computer, in, in tech, computer science we call Asimov's law, right? Which is basically a robot can harm itself. It should not be able to, let me sorry, a robot should not have the ability to harm a human. So AI, for example, should not have the ability to cause or create harm to a human. And secondly, uh, an, uh, a, an AI or a robot should should always obey the human. So we should never have AI that put, poses an existential threat. It should never be, you know, what we call not aligned. You know, it should not be, get, you know, misaligned with a human. It shouldn't, you know, go do things, you know, left field on its own. And that's that's the second one. And third is the AI or robot should, should not have the ability to create harm to itself, right? It should not self-destruct. So those are inherent unspoken guardrails, um, you know, between this, you know, human machine interaction uh, that, you know, the industry is also focused on is how do we keep AI, you know, and delivering tremendous value? How do we ensure it's delivering tremendous value? But it's not creating harm or unintended effects. So that's fingers crossed. That's, you know, the whole industry's eyes open on this one. 
Um, and uh, of course, it will take you know great collaboration between industry, academia, you know, uh, researchers to ensure that this AI revolution we're in brings us brings the human race value and not um, you know not harm. You know, Adi, that is very well said, and I think this is a good note to end our um, webinar on. I know we've literally gone past the hour by a few minutes, so apologies because um, I know a number of you might have to run off. Um, what I have done is I have shared Adi's um, LinkedIn in the chat section. I would encourage everyone to connect with him. Um, you can also connect with me here as well. I'll just send that to you in the chat section as well. Um, before we drive this to an end, you know, I'd just like to reiterate, Adi, I must say I have learned so much. You've really got me thinking, and I'd like to have a follow-up conversation with you actually around some ideas that are literally coming to head now. But I want to thank you so much. Thank you for the time. Um, before we end the call, any other questions from anyone? Any thoughts, ideas they want to sort of share with the team, what we all of us here right now? I see Asif has unmuted his mic. Please go ahead, Asif. Yeah. yeah just, just wanted to thank you both for a great presentation. Very insightful, very informative. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. Um, any other questions from anyone? Also, oh, I know you might not be able to speak, but you can type. Um, oh, yeah, I, I see your response here. Um, also, I'll say thank you for the um, your response and very good answer as well. Um, Said and um, Marlisa, any, any other comments or anyone else on the call? I'll, I'll take silence as a no. And I think that's about it. Well, Adi, thank you so much for joining us again on this webinar. We really appreciate this. And um, yeah, I look forward to touching base with you soon. Yeah, Sherry, thank you so much uh, to you and, and your team. Uh, I thought it was a very interesting conversation. Thank you so much. Uh, and I uh, look forward to being invited back. <laughs> oh, no, thank you, Adi. The, the next one might be face-to-face, -face, actually. We'll, or maybe we'll do a virtual one, you know? You never know how fast this AI business is going, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. Right. Thanks for everyone. Thanks for everyone as well. Yeah. Right. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye.